cleaning the palace. This is the cook guy, or the chef. Hyper good morning, huh? When, I'm, when I wake up in the morning, I'm always so very hungry. When it's lunchtime, I'm also so very, very hungry. Hey, and welcome to uh, Green Party News uh, and also uh, Review. Glasgow uh, this week began with more than 130 presidents and prime ministers posing for a group photo in the century old Broca uh, Museum crafted from redstone, or red sandstone rather. Fewer than 10 were women of their medium age as their host at the Climate Summit, Boris Johnson. Prime Minister of England, uh, reminded them uh, was over 60. The week ended with boisterous protests of thousands on the streets of Glasgow. A march on Friday was led by a young climate activist, some barely old enough to vote in their countries. They accused the world leaders of wasting what little time remains to safeguard their future. These bookends to the first week of the bookends to the first week of this Watershed International Climate Summit in Scotland revealed or reveal a widening divide that threatens to grow larger in the weeks and months ahead. Those with the power to make decisions about how much the warm the world of warms in the coming decades are mostly old and male. Those who are angry about the pace of climate actions are mostly young and female. The two sides have vastly diver a divergent views of what the summit should achieve. Indeed, they seem to have different notions of time. At the summit, leaders are setting goals for 2030 at the earliest. In some cases, they're setting targets for 2060 and 2070. And many of today's activists will be hitting retirement age. The activists say change must come immediately. They want countries to abruptly stop using fossil fuels and to repair the climate damage that is now being felt in all corners of the globe, but is especially punishing the most vulnerable people in the global south. For them, mid-century is an eternity. Now is the time, yesterday was the time, is how Dominique Palmer, 22, an activist with Fridays for Future International put it during a panel discussion at the New York Times climate up on Thursday. We need action right now. Social movements have almost always been led by young people. But what makes the climate movements generational and divided is uh, divided so pointed and the flurry, flurry, flurry of the uh, young so potent is that world leaders have been meeting and talking about the need to address climate change since before most of the protests were born with few results. In fact, admit, uh, emissions of planet warming gases have risen sharply since the first international climate summit 27 years ago. Now scientists say the world has less than a decade to sharply cut emissions to avert the worst climate consequences. That urgency driver drives the protests, protesters, or as one banner at Friday's demonstration articulated, don't mess with my future. World leaders are showing, showing sensitivity to their criticism. Their public and private remarks in Glasgow have been laced with both poems uh, and to the passion of the young as well as a hint of anxiety. They've they'll have to face young voters back home. Maybe of these leaders have done, many of these leaders have done so already with climate action emerging as an important election issue, at least in some countries, including in the United States and Germany. Voters elected their youngest uh, parliament with the Green Party recorded, recording its best result ever in launching climate change to the top of its agenda. 
Mr. Johnson, for his part, warned his peers about their legacy. Future generations, he said in his opening remarks, will judge us with the bitterness and with a resentment that eclipses any of the fun activities of today, activists of today. The organizers of the conference took pains to include youth speakers in the official program. One after another, heads of state and government rose to the podium this week and assured attendees that they have that they had heard the demands of the young. This did not impress Mitzi Janelle, Janelle uh, Tan, a 24-year-old climate activist who has uh, come to Glasgow from the Philippines. And quotes, when I hear leaders say they want to listen to our generation, I think they're lying to themselves, Ms. Tan said in an interview on the eve of the Friday protest. If they are, if they are really listening, she went on, and they want that they would be prioritizing people over profit. Also in quotes, cognitive dis, uh, dissonance uh, was the verdict of Eric Juguna uh, Naiti, who had come from Kenya, who were expecting serious commitments at COP26 on climate finance and climate mitigation. The commitments aren't strong enough. There is a huge gap between how the leaders and the young activists view the summit. John Kerry, the 77-year-old U.S. climate envoy, marveled on Friday at the progress the progress made at his summit. At this summit, I in quotes, I've been to a great many GOPs and excuse me, COPs, and I must have this, COPs, and I will tell you there is a greater sense of urgency at this COP. Mr. Kerry told reporters. He acknowledged the complexity of global negotiations. Diplomats are still hammering out the rules of global carbon trading and discussing how to address demands for reparations from countries you know, from countries that have played no role in creating the climate problem, but that have suffered its most acute, acute effects. Still, Mr. Carey said, I have never in the first two days counted as many initiatives, as much real money, real money, as uh, much real, uh, real money, real money put on the table, even if there are some questions mark, question marks. Jochen Flashbarth, the German uh, energy minister, cited three areas of progress. A global agreement on reversing deforestation by 2030, a commitment to reduce methane emissions also by 2030, and a coal exit plan endorsed by three dozen countries, though not its biggest users. I understand your people are trying to push very hard. Young people, excuse me, young people are trying to push very hard to see concrete implementation and not abstract goals, Mr. Flash 4, 59, said Friday. However, we needed these goals. But it was then it was when leaders spoke to each other away, uh, each other away from the cameras that it was clear that the anchor from the youth was getting under their skin at one closed-door meeting with his fellow ministers, Mr. Flashforth, was heard expressing concerns that the activists were painting all the world leaders with the same broad brush, portraying them as prote protectors of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, you are. Let's tell young people there are, there are differences. Not all the politicians, all the countries are on the same side, he said. Progress is possible, and this is a group of progress. At the same meeting, which was attended by a block of countries called the High Ambitious Coalition, the French Minister for Ecological Transition, Barbara Pampili, said she recognized, recognized herself in the, young, in the young people. She too was once an activist, and she told, she told her fellow ministers. But then she went on, she chose, then she went on, she chose a different route. She chose to work inside the system. I chose to be politicians, she said. I chose to try to act. The differences between the decision making inside the summit and the protesters outside the barricades extend beyond age to gender. While the world leaders and heads of states are mostly male, the streets of Glasgow have been filled with young women. Girls and young women around the world have emerged as some of the most passionate climate activists, arguing that many of those most vulnerable to drought, water, scarcity, and other climate disasters are low-income women with children to feed. As a result, the climate movement has shared a mission with efforts to educate girls in development in developing nations. 
young women activists have found a sisterhood and a sense of empowerment in the climate protest, marches, and campaigns. The inspiration for many of these young women is the Swedish activist Greta Thunberg, whose school strikes for climate that began as a solo effort in 2018 have blossomed into a worldwide movement. This is from Global Green Part of Green Dot News. Victorian Green reacts to Shema's billion dollar road expansion. As by Beish Raja, Raja Kumar. The Northeast Link Road expansion announcement on October 28th has left the Victorian Green Party highlighting the issue of climate change. Northeast Link is the uh, largest financial investment in Melbourne's. Northeast has announced a 6.5 km road tunnels, a lower uh, plenty road interchange, busway, walk, and the cycling pathways, doubles the amount of highway nut lanes, uh, community spaces, fitness areas, and wetlands, to name a few according to announcement. Uh, talk about shameless spring washing. This is a project that's a uh, plowing a massive to a tollway through sensitive urban green spaces and putting on extra 100,000 cars on the road for uh, more carbon emissions and air pollution, said Victoria Green's Transport spokesperson Sam Hibbins, MP on Green Victoria. The estimated $11.1 billion project, according to the age, uh, is under Labour Party leader Premier Daniel Andrews, and it was complete completed between 2027 and 2028 will be completed soon. And a climate crisis when transport is our biggest growing source of emissions, spending billions of dollars on a mega all uh, tollway is nothing short of environmental and economic vandalism, said Hibbins MP. Well, that'll do it for the day. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, and also, uh, stay tuned for uh, my interview with a uh, former candidate for City Council, uh, District Number 22, Edwin uh, de, 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 de Jesus, uh, or De Jesus, or the two. Um, I even asked him by and he's like, whichever is fun. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, go to anchor.fm slash just Calvin for everything Green Party. Same thing with. Uh, 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 my YouTube channel, uh, that's, I believe that's uh, Green Party and Socialist News channel. I'll put that either way, or I'll put that either way in the description below. Support so your uh, your local third parties, uh, your range of voting in your state. Uh, also get open primaries in your state, and you'll have more choices other than Democrats and Republicans. Uh, uh, you'll have Libertarians, Green Parties, uh, Social socialists, whatever, whatever it have you. Either way, thanks for watching. Peace out for now and stay tuned. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, that was... <laughs> wow, I have another raider. Or someone just played Screamo. Yeah, I think that's what happened. I think I have another raid, though. Um, <laughs> Andy Attack 2018, thank you for the raid and this and Slayer Music. Thanks for playing Screamo. Um, Hello and welcome to another edition of Just Calvin. I am here with Edwin De Jesus. He, uh, I'm sorry, am I pronouncing your last name right? Yep, De Jesus okay. De Jesus. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, he he did run for uh, city council uh, in a District 22 in New York City. Uh, came up short, so I uh, wanted to ask. Uh, first of all, how are you today? Doing well. It's a beautiful day outside in the mid 60s here in New York City. So very positive vibes in the air today yeah 
now, now, unfortunately, you you, you didn't uh, you didn't win. But uh, are th- were there are there things that that you've experienced that you could do better in the future? And uh, um, what mistakes uh, have you learned from? Yeah, so this was a difficult race, being the first time I've ever run for any office whatsoever in the middle of a pandemic, uh, where former Governor Cuomo had eliminated Green Party ballot status. So the only way to run as a Green was to circulate an independent nominating petition with the name Green Party at the top. And we actually had to collect more signatures than the Democrats and Republicans because of another law that Cuomo had passed. So there were obviously those barriers. There's the media, which obviously we all know has a bias towards neoliberalism and Democrats in particular in New York City and state. Uh, I think that the bright side was, well, one, I'm very young. I'm only 24 years old. And that's something that was refreshing for a lot of voters. Number two, the Democrats and Republicans have embarrassed themselves enormously over the past few years, but during this crisis in particular. So there were a lot of people who were disenfranchised by the two-party system and willing to vote for a third-party candidate, uh, whether or not they seemed super viable. Uh, So that definitely played into our favor. Um, But things that I would have done differently, I think I would have focused a lot more on youth outreach. A lot of young people, I would say, and this is not based on polling data in New York, but from Virginia, from their recent gubernatorial election, is that the young people and the Gen Zers tend to lean uh, independent uh, more now than ever. And that's something that I'm sure applies to New York City. The issue is, well, there's a few things. One, there's only ranked choice voting in primary elections here in New York. So you don't have ranked choice where it really counts, which is for different parties. You know, New York used to have a proportional represent, uh, s- uh, system of representation where you would have uh, someone like myself in City Hall just based on the number of people that voted for me instead of winner takes all. But now we have like this illusion of choice where you get to rank your favorite Democrats in order and you have to be a registered Democrat months in advance of the primary election in order to participate in that form of ranked choice voting. So that also makes it, I I don't wanna say impossible, uh, but you would almost need to have a super strong backing of, you know, have a big name recognition, have tens of thousands of followers online in order to even come close to making a bigger dent than the 6% we currently hold in in these results that are being counted. So, Uh, I definitely think that as time goes on, it'll only help the third party cause and more young people who come out to vote will probably not be restrained to the typical tradition of picking between a Democrat and Republican. Um, Yeah, I think, I think besides that, um, I mean, there's just a a lot of general lessons for running a campaign that were learned, you know, um, choosing who to work with, what alliances should be formed, uh, what strategies should be played out. I mean, these are all things I was learning as I went. So, um, you know, understanding the legal process behind many things. Now that I understand a lot of that from experience, if I were to choose to run again, I believe I would have a much more convenient time focusing on the outreach and hopefully uh, as this pandemic becomes endemic, that there'll be more opportunities to door knock without weirding people out, because that's something here in New York that I don't think people really like, is to have someone knocking on their door who's not delivering them food um, out of the blue. Uh, I spent most of my time on the street talking to people in front of supermarkets and in parks, which is helpful but not everyone is a registered voter in your district when you do that. So that's also something that was difficult to work with. Yeah, I no doubt. Uh, do you think that um, that before Green Party candidates should uh, try and go for office, uh, that open primaries should be uh, become a thing as far as uh, a legislature uh, initiative to be voted on? 
because that way maybe uh, you have a better chance of uh, making it easier for greens to run and run as greens. Hundred percent open primaries, um, and if not that, then rank choice voting in general elections, which is something that I was happy to pressure the Democratic nominee who ultimately became the winner. I was able to pressure them into supporting ranked choice voting for general elections. So that's something that I'm very happy about. Uh, I don't know when we'll ever see that in the near future. Unfortunately, it's we can't just circulate a petition and have people sign it and then it goes up for the ballot. This is something that the government needs to propose. And why would the oppressors give us the tools necessary to dismantle their power? Um, they gave us ranked choice voting because they knew it was going to cement their own, the status quo, uh, yeah. and give us this illusion of choice and this illusion of freedom to choose who we want to vote for so that we don't keep asking for more. Um, but it really was a baby step forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, and perhaps the amount of pacification among uh, activists who now think that our democracy is being upheld by these institutions instead of oppressed, you know, they're tuning out because they feel like they've accomplished something by electing Joe Biden and pushing forward these reforms, uh, like the Freedom to Vote Act that they're working on in Congress right now, which has some good things in it, but ultimately will destroy third party ballot status, which is the opposite of democracy. It's antithetical to democratic, to our democratic process here in the States. Right. Uh, and um, yeah, it's I'm 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 looking at the whole scenario, and I just can't help but think that in order for Green Party to become or Green Party itself to be uh, considered a serious party, uh, you have to get you have to get people that are more independent, uh, not just young bell, also the older crowd, of course, uh, to to get behind. Uh, getting um not ranked choice voting necessarily which that's that's another component to it but the open primary part because i again the open, open primary uh uh way of doing things is allow all parties to get in there as long as they're registered with the fec so uh my i, I guess i guess the question is uh is there any green party members running for governor we don't know that yet unfortunately um, that's something that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, I don't know, you know I, uh, like I said before, we were decimated last year, not just in New York, but in 20 states across the country. So our resources are very limited. Um, we are hanging on a thread, I feel, as a party. Um, and I feel like there is a chance for a comeback, but I don't know how that's going to play out yet. And mm. as yeah, as far as a gubernatorial candidate is concerned, we just don't know yet. Mm. No, I mean, uh, did all the Green Party members get together in New York? I mean, and help each other out, or was it more of an independent uh, campaign? So, for my campaign, our campaign in particular, uh, there were plenty of Greens who came out from all across New York City. Uh, the Bronx Greens in particular are such a wonderful group of people with years and year, decades of experience. And they came out and helped us get on the ballot, canvas voters, uh, organize protests and other direct actions. Uh, I would love to see a Queens Green uh, happen. Um, I would love to see if there's any way we can put that together now. Um, Brooklyn also very much involved. Uh, but I feel like Queens is really lacking in that sphere. And um, yeah, Greens across the country have been very supportive of our campaign uh, in, in terms of, you know, spreading the word on social media, contributing five bucks here and there, um, press releases. I think that in terms of like which third party that supports working class policies has the best infrastructure already set up to to run viable candidates? I would think it's the Green Party. Right. No. You, no. You're right about that. It's just it's just getting the, the info out and getting people the acknowledgement of that. Um, I yeah, and I think that I after after Howie Hawkins ran, I think that the 
there's a lot of people who don't think he had the personality traits to uh, to run in regards to like you know uh, he, he's not a normal politician when it comes to having an uh, outgoing personality. Everything else he has down packed statistics, knowledge, you name it, he has it. But they did, but he, did, he wasn't bombastic on bombastic, excuse me, bombastic. He wasn't uh, all about uh, you know certain things. He, do you think that hurt him? Or do, you, do you think that it hurt the Greens uh, for not having a uh, a uh, bigger than a life kind of a personality type candidate? Yeah. So. I voted for Howie Hawkins, but that puts me in a giant minority of people across the country. Yeah. And I've spoken with him a few times, and he's a very uh, nice guy. He endorsed our campaign. He has very great ideas about how to expand our democracy and is one of the only voices that I see really fighting um, the corruption that is happening with these voting rights um, pieces of legislation that are currently being pushed by the Democrats in Congress, which is you know, a politically risky thing to do. Um, and then, you know, Green New Deal, obviously one of the original people pushing for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in terms of like popularity, didn't really stick with a lot of voters. I would say, it, yeah, it, unfortunately we live in a world today where someone like Donald Trump becomes super successful because of the fact that they're able, able to entertain you with their wild personalities and their humor. Um, and that's not always a good thing, but it's something that I was able to uh, experiment with a little bit uh, by, be by coming out with uh, tweets that were not, you know, formulated by a group of consultants, just like trail of thought coming from, you know, whatever I was thinking that day. And I do think people appreciate that kind of brunt authenticity and honesty, even if sometimes it goes too far and they disagree with it. Um, but I think going forward, the Green Party just needs younger people to run because that's what's going to keep younger people engaged is to see someone who uh, is part of that generation that is being so poorly affected by the policies of today. Yeah. Do you think the, do you think the, the Green Party is well organized or do you think that uh, uh, it needs a lot of organizing? Well, there's always a room for improvement, no matter what. But in terms of, you know, generally speaking, I think they are very well organized, at least here in New York. Mm. Um, you know, the we have monthly meetings with the with the Bronx and other uh, New York Greens, uh, where we ha uh, we talk about different actions that we want to co-sponsor, and we have different um, uh, policies that we might agree or disagree upon that goes to the state committee. You know. Are we as efficient as the Democrats? No. Are we even as efficient as the DSA? No. But I think, I think there needs to be some sort of revival, uh, like I said before, of young people coming into this process, coming into this party, who are more technologically savvy, who are more um, tuned in to the meme culture of today, and understand, you know, TikTok and stuff like that. I think that's really the, the only way that we'll have a future is if we are able to reach younger people on more intimate levels, like uh, using these kinds of platforms. But in terms of overall structure, I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty well run. Um, I hope it stays that way. No. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I, I, I only judge by my past interviews with, with the, not in front of my time of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for my time of interviewing people, has been pretty much ninety eight percent of it has been Green Party candidates, whether it be independent Green Party or people who are are members of the Green Party but ran as independent that sort of thing due to you know state statewide things whatever. And a lot of times they they tell me I I'd ask them are, are you getting any, any kind of help from the national party and a lot of times they'd say no but of course that was last go around so obviously things could have changed after that but I just I just had that 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 feeling because the Green Party is such a, what do we call that um, not deorganized but uh. Oh, I I remember the the, wor the wording uh, a few days ago, but now I can't get, now I can't get all of it. Um, decentralized. That's what it, decentralized. 
uh, because the Green Party is so decentralized, so many parties and have so many different views. Well, go by the pillar of what Green Party stands for, but have those that may not fit the party's or pillars or pillars, excuse me. Uh, do you think that more of a more of a background checking of sorts to, to some degree is warranted? in order to kind of centralize, but not centralize the Green Party? Well, I don't think the Greens would ever endorse a candidate whose uh, policies are in direct contradiction with their main platform and what they their values and what they stand for. Um, you know, Greens have run problematic people in the past. I mean, Kirsten Cinema was a Green, right? So... Um, and then you have Greens, like in New York City, for example... Uh, State Senator Jabari Brisport, who ran as a Green, lost, and then switched over to the Democratic Party, and then ultimately won as a Democrat. Yeah. Um, I think it's really going to be a, a back and forth between what the overall party wants and perhaps whichever candidates become most successful, taking a look at, at what they're doing right and implementing that into the larger platform. So, for example... You know, one of the policies we supported was the universal basic income. I don't believe that's part of the major Green Party platform, but I would hope that if more and more people are engaged with something like that, that it ultimately will be adopted. Um, that's just one example. Um, and then there are obviously issues that can fracture the Green Party or split people, um, you know, from one city to another. I think, you know, nowadays there's so many issues that divide us. Um, that it's almost impossible to come up with uh, a consensus across the country on on things like uh, vaccine mandates, on um, on to what extent you know do we want to uh, um, uh, play softball with with Democrats on climate and stuff like that. Uh, I think there there are some key things that could be too divisive but we should all have our individual stances and uh as party chapters vote what we as a chapter want to have and if that conflicts with another chapter well every state is different every city is different what might be a thing in new york might be completely different in ohio for example no. um so they can't always be necessarily a hundred percent aligned. No, no, that's true. Yeah, I mean that that is very true. I, I actually, I think the word I was looking for earlier was vetting. That was the word I was looking for. So I apologize for not having that. Uh, but uh, I I have interviewed uh, at Carter State, uh, who's running for uh, Chuck Schumer's uh, seat for twenty twenty two. Uh, are there any, are there anybody, uh, is there someone like her that you're going to be trying to help and uh, get more people out to vote for people like her? I mean, absolutely. Uh, I believe she's upstate, which is a little farther than where I am, but oh, okay. I will do whatever I can through social media to spread the word uh, and encourage others to get involved. Um, I'm not too familiar with upstate politics yet. Um, but that is something that I do want to pay close attention to going into next year's midterms uh, and trying to understand more of what's happening outside of just the city. Yeah. Well, I mean, I when I uh, read up on uh, how many people won uh, the races this year, I mean, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see about 40% uh, of candidates did win their races uh and now in small sometimes small rural places like connecticut uh and maine and places like that but uh i think that's probably the most i've actually seen so far since i've been uh interviewing greens and uh reporting green party news as i will add to this um and so uh yesterday uh i i, I guess I, I i didn't realize what day that we were supposed to do this but uh, I apologize for for uh, for thinking that it was yesterday. It was obviously today, but I put it down wrong in uh, my uh, itinerary. But either way, uh, I I read uh, uh, those that won their uh, their races. Um, I'm I'm glad that uh, Green Party are doing better regards to that part. Um, uh, so uh, 
are there are there any Green Party candidates in New York that are currently running that you'd be able to go out and stump for? Uh, in New York City right now, I can't think of any besides the ones who just ran in this last cycle. Mm. Um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see because, uh, yeah, to my knowledge, we don't have we don't have any right now. Okay, maybe a little too early for that. Yeah. Well, no, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a primary, so yeah, they won't. So the ones who missed out will have to wait until what twenty twenty four. The run again, right? Is it twenty twenty three for the next municipal election for city council? Okay. Uh, well, that's. <laughs> uh, do you have any uh, anything to plug right now? Well, uh, you can follow myself on Twitter at Edwin for NYC. That's F O R N Y C. Uh, most of uh, po political engagement happens on there. Um, I would normally plug our website, edwinfornyc.com, but I have to uh, shut that down now as we close out the campaign and figure out, you know, a new website that we can have up going forward. Um, yeah. Um, Oh, November 15th, which is this upcoming Monday. Uh, I'm also part of the March for Medicare for All group, um, which organized, you know, 55 plus marches in various cities across the country on July 24th. And we're still continuing to have different actions on the West Coast, East Coast, um, all over. And so one of the things that we're doing in New York on Monday is a die-in protest outside of the Pfizer headquarters Monday morning, because we want them to support single payer Medicare for all uh, and prove that they believe that healthcare is a human right. And so if you are in the New York area and would like to participate in that action, uh, if I guess if you go to Edwin for NYC or the Medicare for all uh, Twitter page, which is at M4M4 all, uh, you can see all the updates regarding that occupy Pfizer action on Monday. Oh, I did. I didn't mean to ask you. Uh, what was the uh, the, uh, the electoral score uh, for you? Because I I I haven't I haven't looked it up yet. I'm sorry. Yeah, so it's not a hundred percent counted. Uh, I, it's somewhere like ninety seven percent with the board of elections, and we're uh, we are hovering at five point eight five percent. So nearly six percent. Uh, which I am actually happy with. Uh, I think that's, you know, it's over a thousand votes. Um, and again, this is apparently Astoria, Queens, which is AOC's district, you know, the so-called bluest district in the bluest city of the bluest state in the country. Um, and four in 10 people didn't vote for the Democrat uh, nominee. They either voted for the Republican or myself. Um, and that, perhaps shows a shift, a paradigm shift in the way that even the bluest districts are losing ground. And I think that, you know, all the endorsements and all of the positive coverage in the press can only go so far. Uh, but once people realize that their lives are continuing to suffer, even under these so-called progressive democratic administrations, um, that they'll continually become more and more disenfranchised and leaning towards independence and third party candidates. Yeah, you did a pretty good job from, from what I can see. Uh, I think you sent out a tweet saying something about you took uh, uh, one, a thousand votes from the Democrats and uh, they voted for you. Or, yeah, for, for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, we believe that has to do with the fact that not only was Queens the epicenter of the pandemic last year, April 20, uh, 2020 was a really rough time for all of us. It wasn't just the virus that caused so many people's lives to suffer. It was the greed of the, of the two-party system. And when you have these candidates who claim to be progressive, but meanwhile, they are already capitulating to the establishment and big power players on the establishment before even taking office. It goes to show a little foreshadow of what's to come that perhaps on key issues of gentrification, rent stabilization, homelessness, public housing, we're going to see a lot of private interests getting what they want and working class people not getting what they want. 
at the at the at the hands of city council members who will allow it to happen. So we'll have to wait and see. But I will definitely have my ears uh, perked in high alert, waiting to uh, follow the votes that our, our our representatives make and holding them accountable when they fail to act on their campaign promises. Mm. Right. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, I'm hoping I could be able to talk to you again, uh, maybe when you're a candidate again, or just kind of catch up. Uh, but I hope you have a good day. Thanks for being on again. And uh, sorry, again, sorry about yesterday. No worries at all. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun, and I would love to do it again. Okay, sounds good to me. Have a good day. Take care. Bye. Bye.